Hi there, good evening. We'll be joining you from my car today because it um, wasn't really a quiet place in my household to make a video. So I decided to come down to the waterfront, listen to the, the ice not move because there's no waves right now. A little hard water joke right there. <laughs> Anyways, so for my film review, I chose to take a look at Lone Survivor. And I chose to break down the criminological theory, sorry, <laughs> cultural criminology um, is what I chose to break down. And uh, cultural criminology focuses on the situational, subcultural, and the mandated constructions of the meaning around the issue of crime and crime control itself. As well as, just a separate way to say it, uh, the orientation designed especially for critical engagement with the politics of meaning surrounding crime and crime control, as well as the critical intervention into those politics and how those play out kind of thing. Now, I thought the second um, definition that I just read there really uh, kind of skews well to a, a military movie just because of the jargon, or not jargon, the language that they used. Um, just sounds a little more tactical and beefed up. I don't know. It just made me think of the film whenever I, whenever we were reading it um, as a class there. Um, yeah. So why I chose the why I chose the film? I think it's an excellent movie. Um, remarkable story uh, based on based on true events. And uh, yeah. Anyways, a little bit more about Lone Survivor. Uh, so it took setting during the Afghanistan war, and it's a dramatization of a unsuccessful SEAL mission in which um, four SEAL members, uh, they were basically doing a counterinsurgency op, which in layman's terms literally just means like anti-bad guy. Um, it was called Operation Red Wings, and uh, as the title kind of insinuates, there was only one man that survived that mission. Now, um, the sole purpose of the mission was uh, reconnaissance and surveillance of a um, Taliban leader called Ahmad Shah, and if they could, they were to capture and or kill um, Ahmad Shah. Now, if we take a look at the character of Ahmad Shah before getting into the rest of the movie, I'll break that down momentarily, but uh, Ahmad Shah himself, right off the bat, you just get this um, this very stereotypical post 9-11 um, idea of what the perfect enemy of America kind of is. And uh, I find it kind of interesting because it relates to what we were talking about a bit in class whenever we were discussing what makes crime crime or what makes a social issue a social issue kind of thing. And uh, for the Americans, this guy's the issue. Um, he, uh, a little bit more on a macho. He um, basically was planning and killing as many American soldiers on live TV as he could during the time of the Afghani war. Um, and he was using uh, Al Jazeera, which is kind of, it's like a news network with no I don't want to say censorship censorship because I feel like it is very censored but at the same time like gore wise this guy was uh, beheading the soldiers on live television and then it was being broadcast back out to American people so uh, just kind of putting that into perspective um, these soldiers parents husbands wives kids possibly uh, could have seen their loved ones being decapitated. Uh, so this guy was a piece of work, right? And uh, they really wanted to get rid of him. Now the film begins, you don't, you don't know that kind of stuff, but until a little bit later on in the movie, just want to give you a little bit of background on uh, the gentleman Ahmad Shah. Now the film begins with laying down a little bit of a tone of honor and framing the protagonist um, for kind of the, sorry to say it, but the badass that he is. Um, and the protagonist being Marcus Luttrell, the lone survivor. Now, he, um, 
in this first scene, he's doing a monologue in which he's being extracted um, by helicopter and medics and all that kind of stuff out of Afghanistan after the mission. So it's kind of jumping ahead, giving you a little bit of um, insight into the, like a lot of movies do this kind of thing, but giving a little bit of insight into the character of um, Marcus Luttrell and how he kind of thinks. Now, during this scene, he's doing a monologue and he's basically speaking as if he's out of his own body in a sense. And it's perfect for what is actually going on. So he's being airlifted out because he's absolutely torn up. Um, I'll explain it a little bit, but he gets beat to, beat to no end. Um, he's beaten and battered and he's basically talking about this, this storm that lives inside of us. And um, primarily more in um, the team guys he mentions, which is um, like the, the SEAL teams. And uh, he mentions this storm. And I think what the, um, I think what the director was trying to do here is create this sense of brotherhood. Um, this, thing that he shares with his brothers that he just lost kind of thing from what you'll come to know um lone survivor means he's the only one who survived so basically it starts off with a super chaotic scene and then it cuts into this kind of euphoria um they're back on the home base it cuts back to before the mission actually happened and uh, it's a little bit of character development on uh, all the other SEALs that were in the mission itself. Um, so it talks about, or sorry, they're waking up, they all get together, and uh, they're having a bunch of kind of brouhaha moments. Um, two of them go for a run and competition and all that kind of stuff, and there's rising of a rookie kind of thing. Um, and I think the director is using that um, not only for to create um, to create kind of a familiarness for people that were in the military, um, but also for people, anyone who's been on a team, that whole kind of brotherhood or sisterhood um, and razzing of rookies and constant competition kind of thing, that's what brings people together. And I think he's, uh, I think he's trying to create that sense of togetherness within the viewer also during this. And um, yeah, so I'll skip ahead a little bit because there is a lot to unpack in this movie and I won't be able to do it in 10 minutes, but I'll touch on kind of the main points that I wanted to. Um, I could probably do an hour long breakdown of this movie because it is absolutely super in depth. And there's multiple, multiple um, scenarios in which kind of the Surrett social contra construct construction process is broken down and um, primarily the main kind of initial flip of the script in the film is whenever they're on their mission to try and find Ahmad Shah it's all going seamless it was supposed to be a very clean cut in out kind of mission and uh, what ends up happening is um, they find out that there's basically a small army in this village in which Ahmad Shah was supposed to be. And then they decide to hike out and sit tight for further instructions. And they end up being discovered by a, um, let's say goat farmers. And uh, they're met with this compromise of, uh, with their real world kind of issue, right? Um, and breaking that down from the social construction process. Got the physical world. They're in Afghanistan <coughs> on a mountain. And the goat farmers, which they think are... The whole problem is that they might be goat farmers, they might be Taliban. They know they're from the town there. But the issue is if they let them go, they might run back down there. And then they have a whole army right behind them. If they kill them... Um, it's a moral dilemma as well as it's a war crime as well as they don't want that kind of um, they don't want that correlation with like SEAL teams kind of thing and there's a whole dilemma between each of the <coughs> excuse me each of the members in um, in the team there 
on this issue. So you got the physical world, you got the uh, competing social constructs. Now, one of the guys wants to kill him. Another guy wants to kill him. The other guy couldn't be bothered by it at all. He thinks that it's a terrible idea and that they're going to be doing time in Leavenworth, which is like military prison, and um, so on and so forth. And then one of the guys, I find interestingly enough, brings up the... Um, doesn't want to see any of his brothers on his team on Al Jazeera with his head cut off kind of thing. And they're talking about the media there. And I find that super, super interesting that even in the mountains of Afghanistan, they're still concerned about the media portrayal of their actions kind of thing and what that can have and the consequences of what their actions on a mountain, apart from like thousands, thousands of miles away from their homes, um, what that can actually have. And finally, they come up with um, the idea, or the team leader, Mike Murphy, he comes up with the idea that they're gonna cut the guys loose, the farmers, because they had them detained kind of thing. They're gonna cut them loose, hike on up, get um, connections back with their home base, and then get evacuated out kind of thing. But as uh, if you've ever seen the movie, you learn that as soon as they let them go, they run back down, get the Taliban, come up, and shit hits the fan. And uh, I could go on for hours and hours. Um, but yeah, you can really break down uh, the film itself in the sense that um, there is no hard constructionist orientation um, in Lone Survivor because I don't think the American military, <laughs> they're extremely positivist. It's their way or the highway, they know and think that they're right. Um, it's not kind of, I th this is the same for all war in a sense, there's no construction constructionist theories of like, oh, everybody's right. It's not really how that works. It's very rare, I find, in real-world situations that that even comes into play. Um, but yeah, uh, I hope that was enough information. I, I hope I gave enough from the lectures kind of thing. Uh, excellent film. Hope you guys take a look at it.